Hello, everyone. Welcome to the family. We are so glad that you are here. I so love worshiping God. I love when we come together corporately and we give him our best. I love when we have this opportunity to come together. But but I also want to remind you all that guess what today is? It's Resurrection Sunday. Happy Easter. You see, this is one of my absolute favorite favorite holidays for so many different reasons. Growing up as a kid, Easter was such a big deal in my house. I mean, we would have the Easter baskets overflowing. My mom would, would go and all out. I mean, I knew there was no Easter bunny, but man, I would, I would still get up early and go down and see what was there. I mean, I was pretty old, still coming down the stairs, looking forward to seeing what was in that basket for me. But in addition to the candy, what I really was looking forward to was putting on that new Easter suit. You see, it was it was the kind of time when my mom would take us out and we would shop and we would look and we would find just the perfect suit. And one year in particular, I remember my mom bought my brother, who's a couple years older, uh, Paul. She bought the two of us these Miami Vice suits. And man, it was like, wow, we we had stepped into a whole new stratosphere. Now, I didn't know much about the show because I wasn't actually old enough to watch Miami Vice. I knew the music, the theme song, but I know that I got so many compliments from wearing that suit that I actually wore it out. I mean, I would try to wear it to weddings. I try to wear it to, to graduations, any place that I could. And eventually that suit began to, to get too small on me. I was outgrowing the suit. And that has an important significance for us that sometimes we try to wear something from the past and we outgrow it. And so that's why, in addition to the Easter baskets and the Easter suits, one of the things that I look forward to every Easter is taking communion. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the very first communion, uh, Jesus was actually celebrating the Passover. That Passover and, and Easter and communion are forever connected. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture. We, we see this in Mark 14, verse 2. It says, now on the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? You see, Jesus followed every letter of the law and he fulfilled it. And one of the things that the Jews were supposed to do was to celebrate the Passover and there Jesus was and Jesus was celebrating it. But there was something beautiful that happened at this particular Passover, at this very first communion celebration, what we would call the Last Supper. Jesus was establishing a new covenant. You see, under the old tradition, the way things were set up was there, there, there was sin that was present and there was a spotless lamb, a perfect lamb that was needed to actually come forth and to cleanse us from our sins. In fact, when they actually are celebrating Passover in itself, uh, what they're celebrating is the fact that, that the nation of Israel was passed over when the last plague, the final plague that, that God used to strike the, the Egyptians so that they would let the, the Hebrews go was the, the killing of the firstborn. But, but God said to Moses, hey, listen, tell them to go get a lamb, slaughter the lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the door. And when the angel that's coming forth to destroy the firstborn in the land of Egypt, he's also going to come to the land of Goshen, where the nation of Israel was living at the time. And if he sees the blood of a spotless lamb, that angel will pass over. And so they heard all kinds of crying and screaming and sadness taking place in the land of Egypt while they didn't hear any of that in the land of Goshen. And so Jesus understands this and they all understand this. And, and this is part of the celebration of the fact that they were finally released from such tyranny, from slavery. But Jesus is saying, I want to establish a new covenant because you you're. You're thinking in terms oftentimes that your, your, your enemy is, is flesh and blood and you think of the pharaohs that are alive today. But God says, listen, I'm establishing a new covenant because there is there's a real enemy that you have that you can't see. And that enemy is Satan. And in this new covenant, God does something so powerful, so beautiful. I'm going to pick up in verse 22. He takes these elements and I, and I want you to grab your bread and grab your juice. And, and he says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. Wow. 
You see, they were used to taking and eating and breaking bread, but in this time, Jesus is doing something different. He's establishing something new. He says, now this bread that you eat, I want you to know that this is my body. This is what's needful for you. But in verse 23, it says, then he took the cup and he gave thanks. He's thanking God the Father. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and this meal and for allowing me to be here to, to fellowship with my brothers. And he gave it to them and they drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. You see, the whole point of us celebrating this Easter season is because of what took place in that first communion. And so I want to invite you now with me. I want you to do so and don't take it lightly because God says, Jesus says, this is my body. So when you take it, what we are saying is we are receiving ourselves as a part of his body and we're unifying ourselves with all the other believers. And we're also saying, Lord, we want to be a part of your new covenant that we are saying, not my life, but your life, that I recognize that you are the spotless lamb. So now is not the time to hold grudges. Now is not the time to hold unforgiveness. Now is the time to search our hearts and invite the Lord in, especially on this Resurrection Sunday. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I thank you, Lord, for your body that was broken for us and for your blood that was shed for many. So, Father, we receive that today and we forgive whoever we need to forgive. Father, we forgive ourselves. We receive your forgiveness. We forgive those who've hurt us. And, Father, we thank you, Lord, where there might be in our hearts, Lord, maybe some unforgiveness, some anger towards you. Father, we release that now as we take the bread and we eat. Let's take the juice. Mm. So my question for us, you know, so that helps us understand Passover and communion and the connection. Um, but let's be honest. Why are we still celebrating a 2000 year old event? Like why? Like what? What is that all about? Why are we getting fancy suits and Easter baskets and Easter egg hunts and all the things? Why are we still doing this 2000 years ago for this, something that took place from 2000 years ago? Well, the answer really starts with understanding who Jesus is. Like, who is Jesus Christ? Now, don't laugh at me, but growing up, I actually thought that Jesus Christ was his name. Like, I thought that Jesus was the son of Mary and Joseph Christ. And as I grew up and I began to read the Bible and study and had some amazing leaders help me understand my faith, I understood that the Christ is a title. That Jesus Christ is Messiah, the son of God, the anointed one. And we see this in, in Mark 8, that same question that we started with. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they respond. Uh, some John the Baptist and others say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And then he makes it more personal. He says, OK, uh, thank you for letting me know who others think I am. Then verse 29 and who and he asks them, but who do you say that I am? And there's some silence. And then Peter, my man, breaks through and he says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the son of God, the anointed one. So powerful. But also, as we talked about in communion, we understand that that Jesus is also the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, in the first Passover, in the first time that they took the, the actual Passover lamb, they all needed to get an individual lamb and put it on an individual door. But today, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And we put him on the door of our hearts so that when God looks at us, he gives us access to him because he sees not my life, but a life that was lived perfect, Jesus's life. It's a beautiful exchange. It's now I no longer belong to me, but I was bought by the blood of the precious lamb. And that precious lamb is Jesus. And we see this with John. He 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 points this out uh, in uh, John 1, 29. It says the next day, John, who's John? This is John the Baptist. 
He's out in the Jordan and he's baptizing people and he's telling them repent because the, 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 the kingdom is coming and he's preparing the way for the Messiah, the anointed one. And he lets everyone know. He says right here, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, listen, I know y'all be coming to see me out here, but the one we've been all been waiting for, our hero, our hero, our champion is Jesus. And there he is. And with that, he announced the arrival of the Messiah and the start of Jesus's public ministry. And with that, he actually he has a conversation with Jesus and, and the rest of the story, Jesus asked John, hey, baptize me. And John's like, whoa, 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 I'm not even fit to tie your shoe. I, I can't baptize you. And he says, no, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And as a result, John obeys. And then, and it's beautiful. John baptizes Jesus and then Jesus comes up out of the water. And right there, we see a beautiful picture of, of God, the Father, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in one. The Father shows up and he speaks and he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. It's so powerful. So then the next question is, how does this impact me? How does it impact me? Well, we're going to actually get some help on this one. We're going to get some help from one of my heroes, and it's the Apostle Peter. Uh, what we're actually going to do is we're going to pick up the account of Resurrection Sunday. You know, Friday has happened and it was sad. It was, it was one of those days where hope was lost, where the apostles went into hiding. It's, it's a sad day because they witnessed and saw their king, their, their Lord, get brutally, brutally crucified. And they're thinking there's no coming back from that. And so that happened on Friday and, and on Saturday was still no noise. I mean, they're like, man, could it be? And so we find ourselves here on Sunday, picking up in Mark 16, verse one, it says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Selmane, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Anoint who? Anoint Jesus. It's a custom they used to do then because the body starts to decompose immediately uh, after we, we pass. And so they're going to try to preserve his body and, and so that they can have some, some time. And, 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 and so they're going out of respect uh, and they're going there. And then they begin to have a conversation with themselves. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they heard I mean, excuse me. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They were concerned because they saw that big old thing rolled in front. And they're like, we got all these spices, but who's going to roll that big old stone out of the way? So they're having a conversation with themselves. But in verse four, it says, and looking up, they saw the stone that had been rolled back and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And other uh, uh, variations of this story that we find, uh, the comparable variations of the story of, in the other Gospels, it lets us know that the, the attire that this individual was wearing, uh, it helped them understand that this wasn't a, a, just a human that they were talking to. That there, there was some appearance of some lightning and his voice was booming and they're like, man, what is going on? But I love what he says. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. Don't let my appearance frighten you. Don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus who was crucified. He has risen. I mean, think about that. Think about the news right there. They are coming with the expectation of finding a dead Jesus. They have spices and uh, stuff to anoint his body, but they hear he is risen. Is that not amazing news? But let's keep going. It says he is not here. Some of us, we need to hear that because we're often going to a place of death looking for life and, and no life is there but we need to go to a place of life where Christ is, right? And so as we keep going, it says, he is risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him, examine it, see for yourselves. But go tell this, his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him 
just as he told you. You see, earlier on in this story, Jesus actually tells the apostles, the disciples that are with him, the 11 that stayed, because we know that Judas actually went and betrayed him. And he tells them, listen, y'all are going to leave me. And so be of good cheer, because after y'all leave me, I'm going to go ahead of you to Galilee after I resurrect. So he tells them so that they can have some courage, but they doubt it. They didn't believe. And now he's going back to the very thing that Jesus told them, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And so I've got one big question when I read this. Why did the angel say, tell his disciples and Peter? Is Peter not one of the disciples? I mean, it would make sense if the author just said, hey, listen, tell his disciples. Why did he say tell his disciples and Peter? And as we unpack that, I want you to hear the, the answers and let it speak to your own heart, because at times we do this to ourselves. In Mark 16, 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Well, the first reason is because Peter was one of his chosen. The reason why the angel is saying to Mary's, the Mary's, listen, go tell Peter and the disciples because Peter was chosen. And we see this in the original account when Peter was, was first called in Mark 1, 16, his name was actually Simon Peter. And we picked this up and it says, and as he, who's he, Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon, that's Simon Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting their net into the sea for they were fishermen. Jesus walked on to their job and he saw them at work. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and they followed him. This is a big deal because here's the reality. In their particular situation, they didn't ever think that they would be chosen to go and walk with the rabbi, to be among those that could be brought into that level of, of training. This is a big deal. So they're excited. Their father's excited. And they go and they follow him immediately. They leave their nets where they are. But, but that doesn't help us understand why the, the angel says, tell the disciples and Peter. Well, the, the second reason is, is, is probably the biggest one. It's because Peter was ashamed of denying Jesus. You see, in all of the hoopla and all the things that took place, one of the most tragic from, I believe, the perspective of Peter was the fact that, that in addition to the pain that Jesus felt, from those who just a few days prior, about a week prior, were saying Hosanna on Palm Sunday and celebrating Jesus and the arrival of Jesus and the triumphal entry. And we celebrate it in addition to Jesus having his back turned by them. In addition to those individuals who turn away from Jesus, in addition to hearing the fact that when Pilate says, do you want a criminal named Barabbas or do you want Jesus? And they said, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. In addition to them saying we have no king but Caesar, that they are denying Jesus as their Lord. In addition to all of that. Peter denied Jesus. You see, we pick this up in Mark 14, 29. Jesus is having a conversation with the apostles and, and disciples, and he's telling them, listen, I want to tell y'all they're going to come and they're going to they're going to get me. And when they come get me, I told y'all this was going to happen. Y'all are going to go into hiding. Y'all are all going to leave me. And Peter's like, not me. He says it right here. But Peter said to him, even though all fall away, I will not. You're my boy. You're the Christ. Remember? Jesus, this is Peter you're talking to. Verse 30, and Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Right. And Peter's wrestling with this like, nah, I just don't see myself denying you. But we skip down to Mark 14. Verse 71, 
It says, but he began to invoke a curse on him and to swear and say, I don't know this man of whom you speak. You see, people were recognizing Peter. This is, hey, the way you speak, you sound like him. You look like one of the guys used to travel with him. And Peter is seeing what they are doing to Jesus. They're beating him. They're smacking him. They're doing all kinds of just horrible things. They're torturing Jesus. And he gets afraid. He's scared. And he's like, man, if I'm known as one of his followers, they might do the same to me. And he, in a moment of weakness, he denies his savior. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Uh, some of the other uh, uh, gospels say that he wept bitterly. Uh, in fact, in one of the gospels, it actually says that Jesus and Peter locked eyes, that when the rooster crowed, Jesus turned and he looked at Peter. And Peter just went away feeling like, man, I have betrayed my Lord. So why did the angel say, tell Peter? because Peter was ashamed of denying Jesus. But I believe the third reason was because Peter was chosen again. He says, listen, I know you messed up, but you are still chosen. That when Jesus found Peter the first time, he didn't make a mistake. You see, I know how Peter feels because I remember <laughs> I, I was about seventh, eighth grade and I walk outside and, and I see a dear friend of mine in a battle and it looks serious and, and nobody's jumping in and helping. And so I jump in and I'm going to help my friend and the person that I'm supposed to be helping, he backs away. And I find myself locking arms with this gargantuan human being. I mean, this dude was huge. I had no business being in any type of matchup with this individual. But for about five seconds, man, I was feeling like, you know what? Maybe I can do this. Maybe all these years I have under, underestimated my stature because we were tussling and we were going back and forth and back and forth. And I was feeling like I was gaining on him. I was getting I was getting him. But then all of a sudden I felt like, man, where's gravity? I no longer felt gravity because my feet were no longer on the ground. And we were going around in circles and one revolution, two revolutions, and I lost count. And then we came to a sudden stop. And in the process, man, I was grateful we were on grass. We, he, he flipped me backwards and I landed on my back. <clears throat> All the wind knocked out of me, which that was fine. I can, I can survive that. But in, in the, the tussle, we were too close to the sidewalk and my shoe flew off and my foot hit the ground, bah! and all the people around went from kind of cheering on to, you know, that ooh sound that you hear. And uh, the match was over. Probably in total, it was probably about 10 seconds, but it felt like hours, days, months, years. And I had no more pride. I was so hurt physically. But I was also so hurt because I'm like, man, I thought I was coming to help a friend. I thought I was coming for you and I thought you would do the same for me. I felt betrayed in that moment. And I picked up my shoe. I could barely get it on. I, I mustered up enough pride to get myself from where I was to uh, my bus to get home. And I sat there by myself in my seat with my foot, felt my heart beating in my shoe. I probably should have went to the hospital. But man, just that one tear came down and I just thought about, man, I thought that was my friend. I thought that was my friend. And so I can imagine from Peter's perspective, he's thinking, man, I'm not worthy. Yet Peter was chosen again. Peter was chosen again. And we see this after the resurrection. Peter is now aware that Jesus is alive and well. And we see this in tw verse 21. I mean, chapter 21, John 21, verse one, it says, and these after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. So Peter's like, man, all right, praise God. Jesus is alive. I'm, I'm grateful. 
but he does something strange. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other sons of the disciples were together. So he's hanging out with the, the disciples, and he says something right here. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. You see, where did Jesus find Peter and his brother? At the very beginning of his calling, he found Peter fishing. And remember, Peter left his nets and immediately he followed Jesus. So why is he back there again? Well, I believe was because he felt like, you know what? I am too ashamed for denying Jesus. I can't keep going. But Jesus says, listen, Peter, you're being chosen again. And we see this in uh 21 verse 4 it says, but that when the morning had come now, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know who it was. They didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus calls out to them. I'm going to help you hear the rest of the story for the sake of time. And he says, hey, have y'all caught anything? And they say no. And he gives them some direction and they toss the net and they catch all these fish. But miraculously, the net doesn't break. And they realize that is Jesus. And Peter gets out of the boat. He can't even wait to get back to the shore. And he's running to Jesus. And then they're having a conversation with their Lord. And Jesus actually is cooking them breakfast. When he was talking to them about getting fish, he just wanted them to know who it was. He already had breakfast prepared for them. And we pick this up in verse 15. It says, and when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You see, Jesus is asking a question because he's trying to do something for Peter's heart. Peter denied Jesus three times, but Jesus asked Peter this question three times. He says, do you love me more than these? And then Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And then he responds. Jesus says to him, then feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And it's such a beautiful picture of restoration because it starts off with Jesus saying, do you love me? And the kind of love that he talks about, it starts off saying, do you love me? And he says, do you agape? Do you have unconditional love for me? And before Peter was like, Lord, you know, all's going to fall away, but I'll never leave you. And, and he realizes that, man, I got a ways to grow, a ways to go. So he tells Jesus, yes, Lord, I like you, I phileo you, I love you, brotherly love, not unconditional love. And the Lord says, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? And then he responds a second time, says, Lord, I, I brotherly love you. And then Jesus says, okay, do you brotherly love me like a brother? That's enough for me, Peter. And Peter, he feels cut to the heart. He's like, Lord, you know all things. And he knows now what's going on. And then Jesus tells him at the end of that, Peter, I am choosing you again. I am choosing you. And I want you, Peter, to feed my lambs. Wow. You see, when we understand the Easter story from the perspective of Peter and from our perspective, oftentimes we find ourselves just like Peter where we were called, God mentioned our name. He reached out to us, but for whatever reason, things we've done in our past, we felt like, you know what, I'm not worthy. You know, I'm in that camp. I've done things that I'm not proud of, but just like Peter, I can see Jesus standing at the shore calling out to me and saying, do you love me? Today, I believe Jesus is asking you, have you answered his call? Have you answered the call? See, I know exactly where I was when I answered the call. I, I considered myself to be worthless, useless, that I had sinned too much. I had done so many things in my teenage years out of rebellion. I thought, God, you can't use me. Why would you use me? Like I, the moment I come to the party, I've, I've ruined this place. I mean, heaven is perfect and I am not. But he reached out his heart to me and he says, I want to give you a new heart. Will you answer the call? And at 17, I answered the call. Growing up in a Christian home, knowing all about who Jesus was, but at 17, I answered the call. At 17, I got to know Jesus, my 
Messiah. At 17, I started listening to Jesus. At 17, I began the process of trusting Jesus. And at 17, I began the process of following him. Well, friends, it's the same process for you. I want to invite you wherever you are. I want to invite you that if you have not yet answered the call, today is the day on this wonderful day, on this Resurrection Sunday, will you follow him? Will you get to know your Christ, the Messiah? Let's pray. Well, Father, I pray. I pray, God, that they would answer the call. I pray today that they would allow themselves like Peter, irregardless of their past, that they would know the God of yesterday, today and tomorrow and forever has come. That we no longer need to get a lamb that is spotless because, God, you are the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And I pray that they would allow themselves just like I did at 17 to say, I'm going to walk down that path. And have my life been perfect since then? Absolutely not. But the perfection that we all now have available to us is in the life of Jesus. So, Father, I pray that they would respond today. If that is you, I want you to pray with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, today I answer the call. Today, Lord, I choose to get to know you as my Messiah, as my Lord. Today, I choose to open my ears to listen to you. Today, Lord, I choose to trust you. Lord, today I choose to follow. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, we've got one last worship song on this Resurrection Sunday. I want you to worship God, give him your all. And if you've prayed along with me, I want you to text the word hello to 833-750-1352 or fill out a connection card. Let us know that you've prayed that prayer and we're gonna follow up with you. We wanna help you take your next step. God bless, let's worship God and let's enjoy this Easter season. God bless y'all, love you.